Um, if we can flick to this one over here. Excellent, thanks. So, uh, after that wonderful introduction, I'd like to say hello. My name is Joshua Green. I uh, am a postdoc um, at MIT, uh, where I run this thing called the Convergence Culture Consortium. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit today, um, and what I've, I've been asked to do, and, and what I'd like to do, is to just kind of set up this concept of convergence culture, to map out some of the ways that we at MIT are looking at, at the evolving media landscape, and to sort of um, trek a few paths or, or path a through, few tracks through it or something. Um, as it says uh, in, in the description for my presentation, we're going to do a general kind of overview of what convergence culture is and how it's affecting the, the landscape in which we, we operate as, as media and entertainment, as politics is changing, the impact that it's having on the way that we relate with, with consumers, the way audiences are constructed, the way we think of uh, old mediums like television um, and unfortunately new mediums like the internet. Uh, and then what we're going to do is look at some of the, the kind of major implications or the, the longer term um, changes that are taking place. Um, I'd like to start by talking about the woman having an orgasm, uh, sorry, a migraine on, on the grass there. Um, the Microsoft Zoom was introduced uh, about this time last year. And it's a really, really curious device. Um, it's a curious device partly because of some of the things that were said about it when it was being introduced. Now, it is, of course, a, a, an iPod killer. It's a, a media player. But one of the... Um, someone's on the phone. One of the things that was, was unique about it was the fact that, that it had this Wi-Fi... Uh, it's Wi-Fi enabled. And what this allows you to do is to transfer content, ostensibly, from one zone to another. Now, what particularly piqued my interest is that when this was being described, Steve Ballmer, of all people, started to use the word squirt. And so he was saying what's unique about the Zoom is that you can squirt content from one person to another. And I think that this idea of squirting, particularly to talk about you know, transferring media um, and squirting as enabled by something as robust and rigid as a Windows media player, is an interesting uh, entry point to the sorts of discussions we like to say. Because squirting is not really what technology does. Squirting is what toothpaste does, or kids with a mouthful of water, or something. You know, it's this, it's this particularly tactile and somewhat visceral way to describe the process of, of sharing media. And what I find particularly interesting is that, is that Steve says, uh, in, in talking about it, he says, what's good about this is that, you know, I want, uh, I want to squirt you a picture of my kids, and you want to squirt me back a video of your vacation. Fair enough. That is a software experience. And it was that last point. You know, describing this process of, of sharing content as a software experience, that got my ears tingling. Because when you set up the Zoom, Microsoft welcomes you to the social. So there seems to be this confluence between a software experience and a cultural experience. And Microsoft, in the process of producing an object and making software, of course, is trying to construct um, the cultural experience as one enabled by the technology itself. And I'm not sure this is necessarily the right way to think about it. Because one of the first things that happens when you boot up a Zoom um, is that you get an error screen. Um, and the error screen is most definitely a software experience, but it's not a particularly pleasant one. And they used this quite curious frame um, when the error screen, a uh, picture when, when the error screen came up of this lass um, on the grass perhaps having a, a migraine. And what was interesting about this in, in understanding the way that our relationship with technology has changed. Um, is that uh, no sooner had the error, sc error screen come up than people across the internet started, uh, started to macro it, started to attach words and overlay images onto the screen in order to kind of comment on the experience that's going on. And this is a process that, that we've seen a lot more generally. Um, uh, down in, in the right-hand side is what's said to be the, the origin of the image macro, um, which is... A, 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 sorry, an image macro is, is laying... Um, often impact font words uh, over an image in order to, to say something funny. Um, so down on the right hand side is a, is a clip from a video game um, and, and the legend of the invention of the image macro um, was that you know, there are these two guys playing video games and one of them can't find the other and he's on the little internet thing and he's like, where are you? And the guy says, I'm in your base killing your dudes. That's where I am. And this was then posted up as something funny people should be laughing at. 
This, this mode of annotating pictures, particularly annotating them in a humorous fashion or to make some kind of commentary, has been taken up across the internet. And we're seeing it at the moment um, bubbling up in what's referred to as a lolcat. Um, and the lolcats are, are on the left hand side. But what we see in the top right hand corner is no sooner had Pelosi been sworn into the house than somebody decided to use an image macro uh, as a way to comment on the political landscape. And so they appropriate the language that circulates within this community as a way to comment on the greater things that are taking place in the world. We're in a, we are now living in an environment where making a picture that says, I'm in your house and pitching your dudes, is a legitimate political statement. It's also a legitimate way of commenting on the world around you. And I think that's actually pretty cool um, because it changes you know, ideas of what counts as official political statement, as acceptable ways to respond to the world around you. It's also uh, a great example of the way that people are taking the tools that are, uh, sorry, taking the content um, that is often being pumped down to them and using the tools at their disposal um, to say something back. And these are some of the things that we're going to talk about today. Um, and of course, sometimes you really want to zoom. Okay, a few words about what I do and then we'll get on. Um, so I run this group called the Convergence Culture Consortium. And we're a research group at MIT. We work with uh, a number of, of companies, some entertainment, some not, um, to explore what we refer to as enculturated, transmediated, participatory marketing experiences. And if you're playing buzzword bingo, that's a total word score of 90. What this means, ultimately, is that we look at the relation, changing relationship between creative consumers, brands, and media properties within a convergence culture environment. And that's what we're going to talk about today. It's audience participation time. I have a question. So if you have one of these, pick it up. The question is, which of the following pictures best describes the concept of convergence? Now, there will be three pictures. You will use the little knob to go one, two, or three, and you have to press the green button. It's kind of like reg registering to vote. If you don't press the green button, it doesn't count. OK, you ready? The first one, a smartphone. The second one, a wedding cake. And the third one, a kitten eating an invisible sandwich. <laughs> so take some time now. Tick tock, tick tock, register your answers, and we'll find out which of these best explains the concept of convergence. I really should have thought to give you a time limit or something, I suppose. Okay, 46% said a cell phone, 15% said a wedding cake, but 39% said a kitten. I'm glad that 39% said a kitten. Um, I'm a little disappointed that only 15% of you said um, a, a, a wedding cake. Ultimately, it was a trick question, of course, because in some way, all of them actually express some kind of understanding of convergence, but there are different sorts of understandings. Um, if we can go back, so I want to talk through this cell phone because it's a cell phone that a friend of mine was working on. It's a smartphone. Now this is a very, very early prototype and this was back in the 90s so you'll have to excuse how crude the cell phone looks. But I want to talk through the cell phone as an object of convergence. So what was so good about this cell phone that he was working on was that it included um, an iPod. You know, it had a music player in it. It had a video camera in it. It had an electric razor in it. It had an industrial grade laser, it had a Boss drum machine, it had a Swiss Army knife, it had a circular saw, it had a friggin' robotic arm, it had a Gibson guitar, it had a Pepsi vending machine, uh, and it had a lightsaber. Um, it also had a, a printer and a scanner, but I couldn't fit them on the slide. As far as I'm concerned, that's a friggin' awesome cell phone, because the day I can get a cell phone with a robotic arm in me is the day that I will sell my soul to a cell phone company. Ultimately, however, this is a model of convergence that, prem, uh, that gives privilege to technological devices. And this bears out what, what Henry talks about uh, in, in the book um, when he talks about the black box fallacy. So the black box fallacy of convergence is the idea that what we will reach a convergent age, our, world, our lives will be made better and our experience of media will change when we get one black box that manages to do everything. Now, this black box is being put in our pockets at the moment. It's being put in the living room. It's one that we're constantly um, being sold. 
And the problem with the black box fallacy is that it makes convergence a technological practice. It says convergence is a software experience. It's an experience that's dictated by people who make devices, by people um, who make content for devices, not by the people who actually use those devices. Which is where we get to the wedding cake. Um, I prefer this as a way to explain concepts of convergence. So this is a lass called Carol Orsini. Now, she's a journalist. She's also an incredibly big gamer. Um, that's Carol in the front on her wedding day, uh, and in the background is her husband. Um, Carol's looking very excited because Carol's wedding cake was a pile of video game consoles. Um, I like this as an idea of convergence because it expresses the kind of brand affinity that we talk about with convergence. It talks about our changed relationship with technology, but it also talks about the everydayness of our technological experience. You know, technological wonders come along so rarely these days. Um, our relationships with technology have changed so substantially that it seems completely appropriate to want to celebrate your wedding day by making a cake um, out of what were once probably very high-tech devices. And what we also get um, is, is kind of the undergirding principle of this idea of convergence culture. Um, and that's Henry on the left when he's in Second Life. Um, and basically, convergence culture and the ideas of convergence um, are about uh, a site where new and old media collide. So it's about this bringing together, not the construction of a new box. Okay, so it's an experiential process. Um, it's where new and old media come together. It's where grassroots um, and corporate media intersect. It's where the power of the media producer and the power of the media consumer interact. And that's what we're really talking about when we're talking about convergence, and particularly convergence culture. Um, because devices can be made, and many, many brilliant devices are made every single day. And like many, many brilliant television programs, many of them disappear without a trace, um, no matter how good they are. And the wonderful case in point is, is, is the beta, which is you know, still um, the best video cassette uh, format you can get. But ultimately, it didn't have enough uptake. It wasn't ingratiated within people's cultural practices enough in order for it to be um, uh, successful and significant. And so what we're going to look at today are some of the principles that underpin this idea of convergence um, as a coming together of things, but also as a series of cultural rather than technological practices. So convergence uh, is kind of personified by three broad, three broad coming about, three broad events. And the first is the production of transmedia texts. Um, and this is the tendency for content to flow across multiple platforms. Now this is... We're going away. This is enabled by the conglomeration um, and the cooperation of multiple media industries. Um, and it's also made possible by the migratory behaviour of, of media audiences. So people who are prepared to go from site to site in order to follow the links of media uh, across different sites. It seems we're having it twice. And so the first thing to kind of realise, the first important thing to understand out of all of this, is that convergence is a cultural rather than a technological practice. The process of following media across a range of different platforms is a cultural practice. Um, if you couldn't be bothered um, chasing uh, a certain narrative in, in all of the different places where, where it will be discussed, then you're not going to bother, uh, th th you know, then it's not going to be successful. These cultural practices are, are the, the very things that enable the kind of behaviours um, and also the kind of successes that we see to take place. And so, as a cultural practice, convergence uh, is defined by you know, this environment where every image, sound, idea, brand and relationship plays, it out, plays itself out across possible media platforms. And the darling case is, is The Matrix, which was a reasonably successful, reasonably interesting film from 1999 that spawned two really crappy sequels, um, but also a massive platform of other products. Now, The Matrix is different to a tr traditional kind of cross-platform media experience because the narrative that took place in the Enter the Matrix video game intersected with the narrative um, that was being told in the first sequel, Matrix Reloaded. What this meant was that events happened in the video game that impacted events in the film to a rather minor extent, admittedly, but it still happened. And in order for you to truly follow the entire narrative of the Matrix, you need to not only see the film, but also play the video game. And you need to play the video game through to completion. Now, the other thing that happened between the second and the third uh, sequel was that there were a series of short films, short animated films, 
um, released, uh, collectively referred to as the Animatrix. And each of these told some story that took place within the Matrix universe. So it wasn't about just telling the backstory of some character. It was about using the virtual world that was set up by the, the Matrix, the narrative environment that had been established, and exploring it and seeing what would take place. And these stories were not uh, either significant enough or substantial enough or uh, um, probably worthy enough to be fully-fledged films themselves. But they didn't have to. They could be short animations. And so some of them provided some backstory and some of them provided stories about completely unrelated characters that had no connection with the Matrix whatsoever. And so it's this kind of playing in story worlds and the extension of story worlds across multiple sites that defines the concept of transmediation. Um, and we see it continued in, in The Matrix Online, a series of subsequent video games, um, but also uh, storybooks and, and down on the, on the right-hand side in fan practices because fans are now essentially producers within this same space. They can write stories that, for all intents and purposes, cohere with the principles set up by the original creators because The Matrix is not a single-authored text. The Wachowski brothers may have written the original film, and they may have borrowed liberally from a number of places to do so, but, but in doing so, they opened up the number of people who could, who could write legitimate and recognised stories within this story world. And in that environment, the fan fiction that fans might write seems to me equally legitimate um, as an element of transmediation, as anything that is officially sanctioned. <laughs>